below. So we've now reached Coal House Fault. Um, we've got the moat here, uh, acting just like any other medieval moat, uh, just a wall to obstacle pretty much. Um, and that is an example of how the battery we've just been at was innovative because rather than having a big heavy moat, difficult to construct, it had a fence and that was it. Um, so now we're at the park, coal asphalt is up there. And some good Victorian architecture. Um, I could be wrong but at the time this was in use, then the British soldiers would have been the red coats, you know, like the Victorian ones in that sort of um, red waistcoat with that sort of white helmet that like the police wear today but a white one instead. Um, here we can see the pillbox, well it does appear to be one but it doesn't, have, it has a very small slit, um, that slit wouldn't be big enough for a firearm only to look out of, so uh, and it's quite narrow in here as well so I'm guessing that this would actually be some sort of like observation post rather than an actual firing pillbox. in there, the little holes it's got in it, and then the wooden frame bits there, and then that's the little gap that you was talking about. Also this uh, post has um, an, what appears to be paint on it, black. Uh, now this could have been the original camouflage paint, many pillboxes did have camouflage paint on them and it can be seen in little bits today on a lot of them but um, perhaps this was just some sort of renovation that went ahead many years ago and never really took off. Uh, who knows? So we can see some slate here. Um, perhaps this means it was a Victorian construction, um, like the fault, although uh, who knows? I'm not sure if they actually used slate in the wartime era. They may well have done, though. Hello, so here we are. Uh, at the XDO tower in Coas Falls grounds. Um, this was otherwise known as a minefield control tower and it's from the Second World War. It had been used as a sort of observation post down to a minefield. Uh, one would obviously have been there in the Thames and they'd probably have some sort of method of either detonating the mines or calling an order to someone else who would detonate the mines from this tower. quite secure although we may be able to get in via a tight squeeze we're not sure yet though and I wouldn't build your hopes up tight squeeze eh see the German ships before the trees grew anyway. <laughs> Coming in to set the mines up. Uh, the only problem is Sam? Whatever's there. Look up. Hey, Joseph. How's it going? Okay. Joe, if worse comes to worse, we'll have to just climb out here and face the drop. Yeah, but um, anyway, you've got this bit here, but also there's this here, and up here there would be a little metal basket originally coming down, and you'd be able to stand in it and look out there, but that's all gone now. But we're lucky to get in next to the young town, so there's only a few in the country. It's probably the only preserved one, the rest of them rotten, really. Um, I mean, there's one good one on. Um, the Burnham on Crouch, but I don't know what that's like.
on your Brexit. So uh, this here is a World War II firing wall with loopholes in it um, and that's an addition to the original Victorian design which you can see beneath it. I can just imagine all the soldiers like run up to this and going oh! Right, this here is a spigot mortar. Um, a mortar ship here, and it would be a mount for a spigot mortar. You can see another one there. Uh, they were weapons used by the Hun Guard, uh, mainly the Black Bombard, as it's called. Uh, and that's just like an, an old mortar used by the Hun Guard, but it relied on some very primitive technology probably used in the old times with gunpowder so it wasn't a very accurate weapon but these mounts they're quite rare but there's still quite a lot of smoke across the country you'd somehow like put your um, mortar stand on there crouch down and then you'd like line it up with all the sighting devices and then you'd just squeeze it and it'd shoot off over in the distance and you can see another one of them there so these would be 1940 39 1941 even, something like that. Right, so um, here we have two cannons. Uh, I'm not sure the size of these, it does say. It says steel mark um, 23 N number SV49I2T. Um, I don't know. Nine, um, it doesn't think Oh, here we go. This is a six inch gun. Um, this is probably one of the more later guns, I'm guessing, probably from the war World War II time. Perhaps a bit earlier than that, actually this is a bit too big really than what I'd expect they'd have in World War II. But, um, this would have been up on the top, um, firing out, and if you just come to the end, you can see two shells. Those probably would have been slightly bigger than what would have fitted in it, although I could be wrong. Actually, they could be about right. You can see there's these little grooves in there. Now, these go all the way down, and the grooves are actually called rifling, and that is where rifles get their name, rifles, uh, because they're rifled. And these would have been um, rifled muzzle loaders, or rifled breech loading guns, I'm not sure which. Um, although. Uh, there were other guns that didn't have this rifling in there, um, and they would have been called smooth balls. And in a handheld version, those are your shotguns and things like that, because uh, they don't have rifling on the inside. And um, s uh, smooth ball guns would have been a lot less accurate because the grooves would have given the bullet a spin as it comes out of the gun. A bit like if you're throwing a rugby ball, it's more accurate and it goes further if you spin on it. And that is how it works. So uh, these have been bought over, I'm sure, and perhaps might one day be installed in the fault or just put here for a display.
Right, so here we are, it's had the proper front of the fault. You can see the Thames there. And um, the main guns would have been in these sections there. They've got sort of iron shutter in. Um, they're now bricked up and there's no guns in them. Although, perhaps then one day you get around to putting them in. And you can also see one of the searchlight emplacements up the top there. Um, they were a common feature in World War II so that you could spot your targets at night. Although I do believe that was added earlier in the moment too, I'm not really too sure. We're going to look out and see uh, another one of the minefield towers, or it might be an observation tower, uh, and also a quick firing gun battery for World War II. Now test these jet tools to the test. There's an even cooler one to go, come on. Yeah, go that way. Go that way, Joe. You know. I can't. I can't. You can. Hello, so here we are now at the quick firing battery put in at World War II. This would have had some faster firing guns. No, it'd be more like ch -ch 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 if you want to see a few sound effects. Um, they probably would have been a much lighter round that was fired though. Um, so if you imagine. Uh, more chance of hitting because there's more shots, but less power. So, more of weaker ones rather than one big powerful one would probably have come out of here. Um, uh, you can see it's from World War II origin and it's in good condition here as part of the Cowhouse Fort Park. I'm pleased to see that it was kept in good quality. Um, just over there, if you want to zoom in on that, you can see the beacon, and that was put in in the 1980s when uh, the, the Queen went to visit Tilbury Fault, not Coas Fault, which is the one here, but Tilbury Fault, which is further down the river. Um, and that was put in as just a sort of commemorative thing. So, um, we just hear that sound effect before you go again, Neil. <laughs> we can just imagine it. I mean, just feel it. Very realistic. Round of applause, I think. Well done, Neil. <laughs> <laughs>